He said, Dag, you're really lucky to be alive. And some guy said, yeah, you're so lucky, we're going to start to call you lucky. The beating left him with a droopy eyelid and a nasty scar across his chin. He was pockmarked anyway from uh, smallpox when he was a child. So you looked at him for the first time and it was a nightmare of a face, I can tell you. The attack left another deep and lasting impression on Luciano. He saw the gang war between the two aging Sicilians as not only pointless, but bad for business. There was only one way to fix this mess. He took his boss to lunch at a very nice Italian restaurant in Coney Island. At a certain point, Luciano excuses himself and goes to the men's room. And just at that point, remarkably enough, in come the assassins and kill Joe the boss. Masseria was dead before the spaghetti turned cold. Luciano now had a new boss, the very man who had tried to kill him, Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano was very happy to have these really smart, bright young thugs working for him. But Lucky hadn't forgotten his treatment by Maranzano or the outdated ways he did business. The old school of Sicilian Mafia bosses was very formal and had strict codes of behavior and strict forms of even social forms of address and initiation into the Mafia. Luciano wasn't interested in any of that stuff. Bucks is what we're after. In the world of the Sicilian Mafia, there's something even sweeter than money. Revenge. In 1931, Salvatore Maranzano was sitting in his office when uh, his office was uh, uh, invaded by people who posed as internal revenue agents who were actually mobsters, uh, sent there by probably by Luciano and Meyer Lansky. Maranzano was stabbed, then riddled with bullets. By 1933, Lucky Luciano had wiped away the old order, just in time to see the end of Prohibition. He was the New York mob's new boss, respected and feared. Mafia people are known by the halo of fear that surrounds them. And so if you're known as a hitter, if you're known as somebody who has the force to eliminate your enemies, then you gain in stature and you gain in respect. Lucky told a story, or Lucky said anything at all. Everybody listened, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Lucky, yeah. yeah. Lucky left, everybody laughed. <laughs> it was just wonderful to watch this. Everybody got mad, like a knife, right at you. By 1935, Charles Lucky Luciano had risen to the top of the mafia leadership, more powerful than Al Capone, and just as dangerous. He was 37 years old, but as Prohibition ended, the public's infatuation with organized crime began to give way to fear. Something needed to be done. We have made a real start on cleaning the gangsters out of New York. In New York, Special Prosecutor Thomas Dewey was determined to put gangsters like Luciano behind bars. For 20 years, the underworld has preyed on our people and robbed them and then frightened them into silence. Dewey was a crusader, a man with as much ambition and shrewdness as Luciano himself. He was honest, he was forthright, time meant nothing to him, and his word meant everything to him. One of Dewey's first targets was a powerful Jewish racketeer from the Bronx, Dutch Schultz. Schultz was a founding member of Luciano's commission, but he was a hothead. Dutch Schultz became a person obsessed with killing, with violence. And in Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky's world, they used violence only very selectively. When Schultz threatened to put out a contract on Dewey, Luciano stepped in. He saw that killing Dewey was bad for business. This required an executive decision. In October 1935, Dutch Schultz was paid a visit by the Commission Security Force, alias Murder Incorporated. 
The overwhelming evidence and intelligence information suggests that Lucky Luciano and his people, uh, Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, Meyer Lansky, all knew and approved of that hit. But if Luciano was doing him a favor, Thomas Dewey didn't bother to thank him. He wanted Lucky and the vice he was peddling off the streets. He became a lightning rod for law enforcement. He became someone to depose as a crime boss to show the effectiveness of law enforcement against organized crime. Dewey began to build a drug case against Luciano, but pinning a narcotics charge on Lucky proved difficult, so Dewey aimed low. He singled out one of Lucky's underbosses, a gangster named Little Davy Batillo. He ran Luciano's multi-million dollar prostitution racket, and he liked to brag about his boss. And so to get the prostitution people to do what he wanted them to do, Batillo would say, well, Lucky's in on this too. Now, the way things operate in their real world, if Charlie Luciano has given you the authority to operate what is now becoming a very, very lucrative business. You'd be very foolish to say, well, good, and all the money and the profit belongs to me. You'd be crazy to do that. What you should do is once a month, you call up Charlie and say, Charlie, in appreciation for all you've done for me, this is for you. And when Charlie accepts that envelope full of cash, he is obtaining the fruits of prostitution. Dewey figured that a prostitution rap would humiliate a major crime boss like Luciano. For a big time mobster like Lucky Luciano to be convicted of prostitution uh, is a slap in the face. It is an embarrassment because uh, it, it's, it's really considered a, a low level and kind of a dirty business. When word leaked of an investigation, Lucky left town. Dewey began to build his case. He found three chambermaids at the Waldorf Astoria who were willing to testify that Davy Batillo's pimps had met with Luciano. Dewey arrested several of Lucky's prostitutes and gave them a choice, seven years in jail or testimony. In March of 1936, Luciano was tracked down and arrested in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Dewey slapped him with a 62-count indictment for compulsory prostitution. The vice trial put the dashing Luciano in a tawdry negative light. The press and the public turned against him. One by one, the witnesses, forced to wear disguises, laid out the case against Lucky. Finally, Luciano took the stand. Dewey grilled him, called him a liar and a cheat. For the first time in his life, Lucky was cornered. It took the jury less than 24 hours to find Luciano guilty. His sentence was a whopping 30 to 50 years. It was a bombshell. It had tremendous impact politically, socially, and economically uh, on organized crime and on the people of the city of New York. If Lucky Luciano, the most powerful racketeer of them all, could be sent off to prison and labeled the king of the pimps, then maybe the mob was not invincible after all. Luciano's partners in crime left New York. Meyer Lansky moved to Florida and Havana, where he could oversee the mob's gambling interests. Bugsy Siegel chose Hollywood, where he could expand the rackets on the West Coast. Some old line mafia families figured Lucky had gotten his comeuppance. I take it that what you're saying is, if you are a man of honor, yeah. if you are a man of tradition, Luciano was not. That's right. But life in Dannemora prison wasn't all that bad for Luciano, who, despite his conviction, was still chairman of the mob. Luciano spends his time playing gin rummy, hanging around the yard. Little Davy Patillo is in jail with him and does all his cooking for him, prepares his meals for him. Someone else does Luciano's jobs at the prison. He gets his pants pressed and his shirts pressed. And it's just a sign of his underworld reputation. By 1942, Lucky Luciano had been languishing behind bars for six long years. Yesterday's news to a country focused on more serious issues, World War II. Lucky's old city, New York, was on edge. 
more than 120 merchant ships had been sunk off the coast by German subs. Nazi spies were spotted on New York's West Side piers, which were still run by Luciano. Then in February, just days before she set sail, a mysterious fire gutted the Normandy, a luxury liner the Navy had been converting to a troop carrier. The Germans took the credit, but rumors swirled around the docks that Lucky Luciano's thugs had the ship torched, all in an effort to destabilize the coastline and force the administration to bend its knee to Luciano. If the story is true, it apparently worked. Naval intelligence officers had to seek out Lucky Luciano while he was serving a prison term to ask him that he should make sure there would be no espionage, there would be no sabotage, and there would be no strikes. Luciano did not go along with it at first. Uh, my inference is that Luciano was still mad at the law with reason. Lansky talked him into it, said it would be a good thing for the mob to be seen in this patriotic role. And so Luciano gave his permission. To some officials, Luciano's work with naval intelligence, dubbed Operation Underworld, was proof of his considerable influence. They saw mob-controlled fishermen and longshoremen working hand-in-hand -hand to ferret out German spies. It was kind of novel. I think, gee, we can have the mob protecting the country. Isn't that wonderful? But to the FBI, there was nothing wonderful about Lucky's patriotic story. In these recently released files, FBI investigators concluded that records, quote, failed to indicate that Luciano had ever furnished assistance or information to the Navy. The files also reveal that New York's Naval Intelligence Commander, Charles Red Haffenden, was a golfing buddy of Frank Costello, Lucky's business partner in crime. Suspicions remain about the amount of good Lucky did for his country. On the other hand, it was good for Lucky Luciano because the strategy of the mob is they don't give up anything for nothing. So if they're going to do something for you, they want something in return. And the thing that Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano and his cohorts wanted worse than anything was to spring Luciano from prison. And so the strategy was to help the government to do what you could to do your, quote, patriotic duty, but with an eye on asking favors later they picked up one favor right away. Lucky was transferred to a minimum security prison a few hours from the city, Great Meadow. One by one, Lansky and Costello came to see Lucky. If your business is important enough, you're going to have henchmen who will come up and see you and they'll speak in the code language. They were pulling strings, working the system. In 1943, Commander Haffenden wrote a letter to the New York State Parole Board on Lucky's behalf. He mentioned Lucky's patriotic work on the docks and even floated a news story. This one about Lucky's role in the Allied invasion of Sicily. All the Mafia bosses had been alerted by Lucky Luciano that they should be friendly to the Allied forces, to the British and Americans and should help to facilitate the landings in, in every way possible. Again, the FBI found no evidence to support Lucky's story. Regardless, by the time Lucky's parole hearing came up in 1946, he had convinced, some said paid off, all the people necessary to spring him from jail. All except one. And strangely enough, the same gentleman who prosecuted him, Thomas Dewey, is now the governor of the state of New York who would have to sign the papers to release him from jail. But there was a catch. Lucky had never applied for U.S. citizenship. So Dewey had him deported back to Italy. On February 10, 1946, Luciano sailed out of New York Harbor. To ease the pain, Lucky's old friends in the mob gave him a sweet going away present. All the bosses contributed some money to a, a big fat envelope of cash. Just before the, the ship got underway, they handed him this gigantic envelope, which had about three or four hundred thousand dollars in it. He felt very good about that. Weeks later, Lucky Luciano set foot on Italian soil, 
for the first time since childhood. Waiting for him at the dock in Naples, where they had 